51 the woman you all are so desperate that you even brought my friend, John here too. For what? He doesn't even have the technology that you want to so use by yourself. Tony continued. Tony it's fine. Senator, you can proceed to your questions. John intervened. Mr. Jameson, is Batman your friend? He asked. Of course he is my friend Senator. John replied with a smile. Then Mr. Jameson I would like you to reveal his face. Him having such high-tech weapons is dangerous for the people of United States Senator replied. When Bruce came to Earth, Nick Fury made a separate identity for Bruce and Alfred so the normal politicians had no idea of who he was exactly. Do you want me to rat my friend Senator? I am sorry. I can't do that because that's not what friends do. John said. Then you will be charged with aiding and abetting a vigilante Mr. Jameson said the senator with authority. Vigilante? You can't even hold on to Tony, do you think you can hold on to me or Bruce? There is not even a single incident of vigilantism by Bruce and police can't even prove that it was his work. The weapons which he has is already with many departments of the country and the only difference is a suit provided by Tony. The only thing is that he is far more efficient, better, and faster than other people around. John said and everybody on the audience gave a nod accepting it. The technology of Bruce's suit is provided by me. That's my property. As I said you can't have it. Bruce is my friend too. Thank you senator for making us take such a long flight and your immense help in wasting our time. Tony added and started leaving. John too followed and left with Tony. John knew that this was all a facade for showing dominance. The committee knew that they could never force something out of both of them as that might backfire and bring the economy to its knees. This was a power play by the politicians which turned out to be a failed one and an embarrassment for the people of the world to see. John had made such long preparations just to face this day without any worry. There will be a Grand Prix in Monaco. I hope you will join it. Tony said to John as they were leaving. Sure I would join you at Monaco. Take Bruce too. John replied. John left for his home as he had work to do and Tony for his with Pepper. In the next few days Tony and Bruce started learning and working on alk history and alchemy. They were amazed of how vast the knowledge was. They both had plans to use alchemy slash alk history while fighting. After weeks of research the only solution they could come up with was stopping the palladium poisoning but it can't cure him as the reactor continues to pollute his blood. Bruce drew a transmutation circle all over his chest and two small transmutation on his feet to channel life energy and stop the advancement of blood pollution. Even though it will stop the poisoning but if he used his armor too much the poisoning would still rise albeit slower this time. Tony was heartbroken when he saw the results. He had hoped a lot out of it but still it seemed that God had left him barehanded. Tony, in order to distract his mind, started learning fighting tactics from Bruce. He even made an arena at his home just to learn how to fight. As he was practicing with Bruce, Pepper came with a very gorgeous and beautiful woman with fiery red hair color following Pepper. Tony saw her from the corner of his eye and was immediately distracted. Tony received a punch on the face right after that distraction. Could kill you? Bruce said after hitting him. Hello boys. Thomas how is the babysitting going on? Pepper asked Alfred who was watching the fight from the sofa. In the presence of others Bruce and Alfred had different names. Bruce was named as Lucian and Alfred as Thomas. It's fine Miss Potts. Master Stark can be handful but I can take care of him. Alfred said. Alfred had been looking after both of them while Pepper was busy managing the company. That's good. Tony I need your signatures for the last time. It's about the handover for the company Pepper asked Tony. Bruce looked at the beautiful woman, he instantly felt that the woman wasn't simple. Being an assassin himself he could feel that the woman was like him, a trained personnel. Bruce wasn't sure if she was an enemy but he made a defensive pose instinctively. The woman saw that and smiled at Bruce instead. Bruce was confused but kept his guard up. Hello, what's your name lady? Tony asked her. Rushman, Natalie Rushman she said. No she is not. Bruce said under his breath. Come here. Help me take my position and fight this guy. Tony told her. She happily obliged while Tony got down and sat with Pepper. 52 Monaco as she went to the arena she became serious and her body language changed to a fighting mode. She knew that the guy in front of him wasn't simple. Bruce punched at her abdomen immediately which she defended by both her hands. She initiated a kick from the other side towards his upper body which he dodged. This small harmless and flashy moves went on for a couple of seconds. Then Bruce suddenly wrapped his hands around her neck from behind after dodging her previous punch and asked coldly in a whispering voice who are you? I am Natasha. An agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. I am here to evaluate Tony she said as she was trying to free herself. Bruce loosened his hands and she fell down. This guy is really not simple. I took lessons from the ninjas and he could still overpower me she said under her breath. She was the famous Black Widow. The last few months she went to the world of Naruto to learn the way of the ninjas. She was accompanied by other agents like Clint, Rumlo, and others. Even though they couldn't replicate the way of ninjas because of no presence of Chakra, they still learned some tricks. And even got to learn how to use weapons such as Kunao, Shuriken and even paper bombs. These new ways fascinated her and other agents. All the agents realized that all those training over these years would mean nothing in front of a Chunin, let alone the higher Jonin levels. This was the miracle of Chakra and all felt extremely powerless so all worked hard to overcome their gaps. Tony and Pepper didn't notice this small interaction. Tony just felt he was hard on her so said Lucian, she just a lady, please go easy on her. Tony commented. Sometimes he wondered if Bruce would have a girlfriend in the future. His cold manner kept everybody out. 
It's fine, Mr. Stark. He is a good teacher. My two months of defense classes proved nothing in front of him. Natasha lied immediately. Well, he is an expert. Tony said. I want an assistant like her, he added. Thomas is enough for you. Pepper left after saying that. Soon, the day to travel to Monaco came. John came with Bruce and Tony accompanied by Pepper, Happy, Alfred and Natasha. John was not surprised seeing her. She already knew from Bruce's memories. Even though John gave his summoned characters full autonomy but still would check their memories from time to time. In the same way he knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. agents went to Naruto world. He even saw Hydra agents but he didn't stop them because it was almost negligible of what they could learn from their world and they could never invade the Naruto world. The world was closed entirely and in a different plane and they could never enter their plane without permission so he didn't really care. Natasha on the other hand, had different thoughts than John. According to Fury, he knew her from before but she was sure she had never met him before today. John supposedly knew her story from a parallel universe. Fury always felt that John wasn't as simple as he showed so told her to be on the lookout for him and try to extract more information if possible. John smiled at her when he met her on the plane but didn't say anything. She also noticed tattoos on his arms. She felt weird but didn't ask. They finally landed in Monaco and went for the high-end hotel. They next day all went to attend the Grand Prix. Pepper could sense something was wrong with Tony. On asking he always denied so she stopped poking her nose. Justin Hammer was also there and Tony didn't let go of the chance of insulting him as usual. As all were having food at the table Tony suddenly vanished by excusing himself. When they noticed that Tony was missing for few minutes, they got curious of what happened. Suddenly Pepper saw Tony in the racetrack replacing the driver in television. Pepper was surprised after seeing this and got worried because racing wasn't for the faint-hearted. Bruce raised his eyebrows but didn't say anything. A person who was dying tended to be self-destructive. Bruce, you should go near the racetrack. Wear a mask. Tony might need help. John said. Bruce was surprised by what John said but left immediately. Pepper did you bring the suitcase? John asked Pepper. Yes. Why John? Is something going to happen? Pepper was more worried now by the question. Well something might happen. But you don't have to worry about it. Bruce is here. Miss Natasha you should call Fury. He needs to hand over the archives to Tony. It's almost time. John said while looking at Natasha. Well it seems like my hard owned cover is blown instantly. Natsuha said with a sweet smile. John even felt his heart racing at that moment. He had forgotten how beautiful Natasha was. Her figure alone could kill many people. Natasha. Aren't you Natalie? Who is Fury? Are you a spy of another company? Pepper asked, now agitated, while looking at Natasha. But John said. It's fine. She is here to protect Tony. You need to go Pepper. 53 Whiplash. Tony just completed a lap and was proceeding to the second one. But as he was driving he saw a man on the track walking on the track from afar who was wearing a very rudimentary exoskeleton on his body while holding a two lashes on his hands that was sparkling with electricity running through the lashes. There was a half-cut car behind the man signifying the man had damaged the car with his lashes. Tony wanted to stop his car but he was cruising very fast. The man hit his car with the lashes. It immediately cut his car in the front which catapulted his car in the air forward and crash landed upside down few meters ahead. Tony wanted to get out of his car but he was stuck and the man with the lashes was approaching him slowly. As he was approaching there were suddenly five sharp knives that looked like bats stuck the track in a circular shape between Tony and him. The moment the knives stuck there was blue spark like electricity around it and the next moment there was a huge wall of at least 10 inches thick that rose from the ground diving Tony and the man in lashes covering both side ends of the track. Thanks Bruce Tony murmured. This was Alcastri. Bruce took the Alcastri path as he felt that it could help people with injuries and launch long range powerful attacks. Tony liked alchemy more and felt alchemy was better and researched on it. The man in lashes was dumbfounded by the wall that formed in front of him. The wall was so thick that he couldn't destroy it immediately. He could see the whole wall that rose was formed by the ground underneath as it created a dip beside the wall. As Tony was thinking what he should do as he was sure this wall wasn't going to stop this man for more than a minute he heard a car engine from behind. He saw his Rolls Royce car approaching him. After it stopped in front of him Tony eyes gleamed as he understood his help was here. Tony took the, the suitcase from Happy and opened it. The suitcase slowly transformed into a suit. It was exactly the same as the Mark IV suit in the original world. The only difference was that there were special writings and signs all over the arms leading till the elbow. Tony had drawn the iron alchemic transmutation circle all over the suit in his arms, exactly the same as the iron blood alchemist in the anime. Tony felt safe now as he now had enough equipment to fight this new man. He didn't think much about this new man but the arc reactor on his chest surprised him. He always thought only he had that technology. As the wall in front of him broke down by the continuous barge of the lashes, the man came through the damaged wall. Without uttering a single sentence he immediately attacked Tony. Tony dodged on the side while clenching his fist. He stuck both of his knuckles together. This instantly created a blue lightning spark like before but this time it was in his arms. He hit the ground with both his arms and suddenly bunch of iron chains rose from the ground. The chains flew towards the man in lashes and immediately bounded him before he could react. It wrapped around his arms, legs and abdomen rendering him immovable. The chains that came out of the ground created a 3 meter wide depth as the iron content on the road wasn't so high. 
Tony even had to use the iron fences on the sides to compensate for iron deficiency around. What the hell is this? The man shouted. Alchemy, you should study more. Tony replied as he approached the man. He saw the arc reactor on the man's chest and removed it. Where did you get it? Tony asked him directly. Ha ha ha, you lose Stark. You lose. Ha ha ha, the man replied hysterically. The authorities came seconds later. Tony removed the chains after striking it with his hands. The surrounding audience looked at him with an astonished expression. This new kind of power surprised everybody. What the hell was that? I thought Tony Stark could only use missiles and fly around. Where did this new electricity come from? Those chains and wall rose from the ground. Does Tony Stark have some special powers? One person in the audience said. I don't know, but it looked so cool. Bringing the chains out from ground and making that wall. Another person replied. Everybody thought that the wall was created by Tony as almost nobody saw the batarangs that stuck the road. Even though many people followed the works of John but most of the people disdained watching animated series as they felt it was beneath their age to watch these so most of them hadn't watched the series. John had given the knowledge of alchemy to Tony because it would help the people understand that the knowledge of alchemy was real and in this way many people would watch the series and gain more fan values via that. Tony would act as the greatest advertiser there ever was. 54 Self-Destructive Mode Tony came back from the track after putting away the suit. He saw Bruce and others sitting in the table while most of others left who were attending the race due to security reasons. You selfish piece of sh asterisk t. What were you thinking? Do you know how dangerous it was? You were almost killed just now. Do you even think of others who care about you? Pepper shouted in a very loud voice. Tony just kept his head down. He knew this was dangerous and it was his fault. Bruce and John didn't comment on anything as they knew why Tony was acting weird. A person who was dying might act in a self-destructive way. This was normal. And especially a person like Tony, who all his life had been in control of everything. Thanks Bruce for the help. You saved my life again. Tony said to Bruce without replying to Pepper because he knew no amount of apologizing would remedy the situation. Bruce just gave a nod and didn't say anything. Who was he anyways? How does he have the arc reactor Tony murmured. He is Yvonne Vank, son of Anton Vank. Anton was a colleague of your father Howard. That's how he knows the arc reactor. Anton wanted to make money out of the arc reactor so Howard deported him to Soviet Union. Yvonne inherited all the knowledge from his father. So that led to this situation. Your previous generations of hatred continued till now. John said in one breath. What? You know him? Son of father's colleague. That's a first. He has been arrested already so it doesn't matter. But now the Senate will come after my posterior soon. What a headache. Tony said. He didn't ask the validity of John's claim. Being able to dream of various universes came with a perk of a peak in the future. At least, that's what Tony believed. Everybody returned to USA after this event as this destroyed the mood of everybody. The birthday of Tony was approaching fast and Tony was thinking of enjoying it to his fullest. As it might be his last birthday, although he might get help from the Naruto world but he didn't have enough confidence if they will listen to him. John could always help Tony with his poisoning but he wanted Tony to go through this cycle. It was important to build his character. And this would also catapult his company to a much higher level in the energy sector after he invents the new element. That's why he told Natasha to inform Fury. It was useless to play long mind games. Though he wasn't sure if Fury would listen to him. After they returned the story of Tony followed exactly as the same as Iron Man 2. Tony did more outrageous things and on his birthday he used his suit to entertain the guests. Bruce didn't stop him as he knew Tony's situation. He even asked John for his help. John just told him not to worry, so Bruce left Tony to his instruments. As the birthday celebration continued Rhodes came and saw the mess Tony had created. He was angry because he had been working hard to defend Tony. The US military wanted to tear down his house and take away his suit. The Senate also suspected that Tony had new knowledge which was called alchemy. They did research on it and found out the powers of it through the series that John created. They immediately approached John to give them the information of it. John just said it was the property of Tony and he was the owner of the knowledge. John didn't even hesitate to pit Tony. Tony had shield behind his back so he was sure that it would only a slight inconvenience to Tony with the knowledge of alchemy. Actually even if John said he had the knowledge of alchemy the Senate couldn't force him to reveal this. As it fell under the jurisdiction of shield and John being a consultant of shield was already safe from the hounds of Senate. It's just that John always subconsciously forgets that he was the consultant of shield because of the presence of Hydra. Rhodes went to the laboratory to wear a suit and came back to the upper level where the celebration was going on. Shut it down. Rhodes shouted with anger. All, except Bruce, immediately left. Tony who heard this didn't pay attention and asked the DJ to continue playing the song. Then the fight ensued. And the fight followed like it was supposed to be, with a huge blast at the end caused by their both hand thrusters. Tony was thrown away by the blast and felt unconscious. After Rhodes came out of the mess he saw Bruce standing a little far looking at him. I thought you are here to make him better, you disappointed me. Rhodes said to Bruce. Rhodes being a great friend of Tony, knew the identity of Bruce. Do you really think you can just walk away with Tony's suit without him allowing it? If you think so then it means you don't really know Tony. Bruce replied. Rhodes was stunned when he heard that. But when he thought about it he couldn't understand why Tony was behaving so weirdly. He looked at Tony with a complicated expression and then flew away to the US Air Force Base. 
55 a new element. The next day when Tony got his bearings he flew away wearing his suit. He needed some air and wanted to eat burger and donut. As he was eating while sitting on the roof of the fast food joint, Fury appeared out of nowhere and instructed him to come down. I told you I won't join your superhero boy band. You already have Bruce. Last I remember I was rejected. Tony said while sitting in the cafe opposite to Fury. Bruce told me that you have palladium poisoning and your days are numbered. Fury said instead. I know. I have been trying to use every known element. Every combination and permutation possible. There is no replacement to it. Tony said. And I am here to tell you that you haven't tried everything possible. Fury replied. We have much to talk about Mr. Stark. Let's go to your home. Fury added. After reaching Tony's place, they could see there were repairing being done. It was probably Bruce who ordered it. Hello Bruce. How are you holding up? Fury said after having a handshake with him. Well I can't complain. Tony gives me everything I want. Bruce shrugged and said without taking any note of the emotions of Tony. Hey we are here to talk about me. You said I didn't try all possible elements. What do you mean by that? Tony interjected. Fury then told him of Howard's invention and said that only Tony could complete his works. Tony didn't believe him as he always felt his father was a cold and calculative man. Fury didn't reply to that and instead gave him a box of archives that was left by Howard for Tony. Howard was the founder of S.H.I.E.L.D., so in a way your well-being is our responsibility. Find a cure soon Tony. I will always keep an eye on you. I have told Bruce to assist you on this new research. He will be your babysitter till you find a result. Fury said before leaving. Tony opened the archives and soon found out his unfinished notes and a video where Howard saying that the model of the Stark Expo was the future. He ended the video saying Tony was his best creation. Tony got emotional by that as he felt that he might have misunderstood his father. Seems like you misunderstood your father. Bruce said from behind. Master Stark your father seems like a good man. Bruce didn't get to see his father for a long time. A family's love is immense. Alfred added while bringing drinks for them. Tony just smiled and didn't say anything while Bruce felt a little sad remembering his parents. We will need to bring this model of Stark Expo. It might be the key to your problem. Bruce said. Yes we do. Jarvis tell Drift to bring out the car. We are going to take a ride. Tony said. As they went outside, a white sports Audi car came driving by itself. Drift take me to the headquarters of Stark Industries. Tony said. Hop in. It's good to make a round a voice said from car. Drift was the name given to his Audi car which got transformed with the help of the cube. After going to Stark Industries he took the model of the Stark Expo and tried apologizing to Pepper for his deeds. As his recent deeds had been outrageous and it had put too much pressure in the company and her. After a small talk he came back. Jarvis scanned the model and give me a digital wire frame of it. Tony said. After the scan was done he rotated the projection. Remove the shrubs, trees, buildings, parks, and exits. Bruce added while looking at the model. That's what I was thinking. Take the frame of streets and lanes as protons and neutrons and add it to the center Tony continued to it. The whole model now looked like an atom model. Enlarge it Bruce commanded. The whole atom model looked stunning. There was a silence. Alfred who was looking into it finally joked congratulations for winning the next year's Nobel Prize. We don't have the technology to synthesize it. Jarvis said again. We have work to do fellas. Time to break this house down. Tony said getting up excitedly. After a day's hard work and tearing half of the home down they finally built the necessary machine to make the new element. We should go, live in New York. John is there. He might need help. He is handling the empire alone. Bruce said after making the machine. You are right. California looks boring now and this house is almost ruined. Tony said. After a hard work and destroying more of his property he finally was able to create a new element. Jarvis informed that his arc reactor could be replaced now with this new element. It was more efficient and totally clean. Tony jumped with joy as he had finally found the cure. 56 The Whiplash, 2. In the meantime following the events in Monaco, Justin Hammer managed to free Yvonne from prison. And cut a deal with him for making suits while Justin would provide the necessary equipment and arrangements. Yvonne said that he could help him making drones instead of suits. As that would be more safe. Hammer accepted this proposal instantly and finally decided on showing his creation in the Stark Expo with that help of Yvonne. But Yvonne had other plans, he had a thirst for revenge against Tony. So he installed a remote inside the drone suit to control them. The only difference in this world was that there were larger number of drones than in then in the original world. Tony's powers in Monaco scared him a bit and he wanted to have a proper protection this time. The next day in the Stark Expo Hammer presented the drone suits. Even Rhodes joined in the presentation. At the moment of presentation Tony got a call from Yvonne saying that he would take revenge for all the bad things that happened to him due to Tony's family. Bruce we need to go. Time to suit up. Tony said. Are you sure you want to use the new core? We didn't even have a test run Bruce said. Doesn't matter. Pepper is in the expo. Tony said while suiting up. Drift you drive towards the expo for damage control. Bruce you need to find the location of Yvonne. We need to shut him down. Tony said. Yes, Batwing let's go we have work to do Bruce said after he sat on the pilot seat. Like Drift, Batwing 2 was a transformer, thanks to the cube. They both flew away after that. Bruce had a new suit which was made as a combination of metal and Kevlar. Tony landed in the event and said to Rhodes we need to get these people out of here. It's not safe. What? Why? 
What happened Rhodes said with guilt as he felt he had betrayed Tony after letting Justin modify his suit. Yvonne is alive. He is behind the drones here and he is coming after us. Justin where is Yvonne? Justin who was still giving presentations was shocked about hearing this. Justin had made sure that nobody knew of Yvonne but now Tony knew. Justin was sweating inside. Tony I don't know what you are talking about. Justin denied on the spot. Tony we have target locked. Rhodes said from behind. Who is the target? Tony asked. It's you. Run Tony Rhodes shouted as all the drones had missiles and guns pointing on him. Tony had to fly away because there were people around the event and he didn't want people to die in crossfire. The firing of bullets caused people to panic and run away. As Tony flew away, Bruce came and confronted Justin. Where's Yvonne? I will give to 10 seconds to answer. After that your fingers will start coming off. Batman asked him. Hey I told already I don't have any clue. We need to control the drones somebody might have hacked it. It might be even you who wants me to be in bad press. Justin said. 9-8. I need my lawyer. Justin continued. 6-5. Fine fine. He is in the old warehouse of Hammer Industries Justin was trembling finally said. Bruce climbed up to the Batwing who was hovering nearby and flew away to the location given by Justin. He needed to stop Yvonne and reboot Rhodes' suit. Bruce couldn't hack into the suit as it was on a private server. He went inside the warehouse after knocking down the security. As he went inside the control room he saw there was no Yvonne. Bruce took out his phone and said. Toolbox hack into the server and shut down all drones and reboot Rhodes' suit. The mobile immediately transformed into a four-legged robot with two hands. Toolbox put his hands on the ports of the CPU and the screen of the main computer changed and showed various command prompts. After a few seconds Toolbox finally said. I have rebooted Rhodes' suit and stopped the drones but these drones are rigged to blow later. We will have to manually go to the scene and disable it. Toolbox said. Damn it. Tony did you hear that? You will have to lead the drones away from people. There is no Yvonne here. He might be coming after you. I am on the way. Batman said. Tony who was standing in front of Rhodes as he was been rebooted heard what Bruce said. As Rhodes' suit came online they were ready to lead the drones away but as they were about to fly away Yvonne wearing a new and improved suit which covered the whole body came flying down. It's good to be back. Yvonne said as he took out his electrified lashes. These lashes were much longer and thicker than the last ones. 57 fight. I have got something for this guy. Rhodes said as he took out the launcher for the missile called ex-wife and launched it towards Yvonne. But it immediately bounced off after hitting Yvonne's suit without even exploding. Never trust Hammer. I told you, Tony said with sarcasm. Rhodes started firing bullets but it did nothing to Yvonne as he had a strong armor. He used his whip to hit both of them but they dodged. I need to be near his suit to do alchemy. The iron content in this place is low and it won't be able to stop his armor nor his whip. Tony said. The fight ensued as it was supposed to in the original world. With both the whip bounding the bodies of Tony and Rhodes. As Yvonne was holding them five batarangs stuck near his ground. After seeing this Yvonne had a bad premonition. In Monaco too it had happened before a wall was formed. Before Yvonne could react the place where the knife stuck the ground bulged forward fast like huge log and hit his body. Yvonne was thrown away a few meters. Tony and Rhodes were freed instantly as Yvonne let go of his whips. Tony got an opening and came to Yvonne who was lying down. After striking his two fists together he touched the armor of Yvonne. The armor distorted crazily while giving out sparks of blue lightning and the whole armor opened by itself. It was the iron alchemy which made the armor fall apart. Tony pointed his hand thrusters on the face and said. You don't think my name of Iron Man is just a name, do you? Tony said. You still lose Stark. I have rigged all the drones. Haha <laughs> people will die and you won't be able to do anything. Yvonne laughed. We know that. That's why I let Cinch, Toolbox, Drift and Batwing to take care of it said a bland and deep voice from behind. That's impossible there are so many drones, your friends won't be able to save everyone. Yvonne said as his face changed as he saw Batman arriving from the shadows. He knew that he has failed in all his pursuit. You need to do your homework Yvonne. I have more friends than I have shown. Ivan's suit suddenly made a beeping sound. Tony understood what Yvonne wanted to do so he flew away. Bruce and Rhodes too left the next second as Yvonne had rigged his own suit too. They didn't want to save Yvonne as a lunatic like him who was consumed by revenge was beyond saving. Tony flew towards Pepper's location. As he saw Pepper standing near his Audi car he knew that Drift had kept her safe. He was relieved after seeing this. Tony really thanked John in his heart as the cube had saved all of them. Drift and Batwing were able to dismantle the drones which were lying damaged without anyone nearby, while Toolbox and Cinch went to disable the drones which were in open public. They did it sneakily as they didn't want people to know the existence of Transformers yet. They did all this when Yvonne, Tony, and Rhodes were fighting. Thanks Drift. Thank God you are alright Pepper. Tony said. I quit from being CEO. This job isn't for me. Pepper said. Tony was surprised by this but he didn't accept the resignation. He apologized to Pepper saying it's because he was dying that he was acting weird. They had a long conversation while at the end Tony finally ended up with kissing Pepper. The next day Tony came to a secret base for S.H.I.E.L.D. and sat opposite of Nick Fury. This is the evaluation given by Agent Romanoff and Bruce. Read it said Fury after handing him a file written Avengers Initiative. Ah. Personality report. Mr. Stark displays compulsive behavior. That was last week. Prone to self-destructive tendency. Damn. Bruce is my enemy number one. 
Come on I was dying. Textbook narcissism. Agreed to that. Recruitment assessment for Avengers initiative. Iron Man yes. See I am still good. Tony said. Read on. Fury continued. Tony Stark. Not recommended. Tony said with puzzled expression how can you recommend me but not recommend me. It means that at this juncture we can't hire you as a consultant Fury said. Tony got up and did a handshake with Fury saying you can't afford me. By the way I need a small favor. Rhodey and I are being awarded. We need a presenter. Tony said with a smile. I will see what I can do. Fury said. At the award ceremony Rhodes and Tony were both presented the award by the same senate who tried taking away Tony's suit on the basis of national defense and security concerns. Tony really felt happy at this as he never forgets to take revenge when he can. 58 meeting her. In the last nine months after the emergence of Tony Stark as Iron Man and Bruce Wayne, the world went crazy. In the previous years his early fan value earning was around 330 million slash per year. Now it had jumped to 400 million. All thanks to new works and of course the emergence of the mysterious Batman. Ding. Total fan value, 250 million. Urging the host to work hard. John had already announced that there would a new Batman movie. A sequel to the previous one. Everybody was excited as they felt it was like a life story of a superhero. Like the one with Captain America. John had already thought of a new character to be brought to life soon. He didn't want to bring a world as that would cost too much. The world of Naruto came with a discount. The next worlds would cost very much. He had already inquired. Even a very simple world with a decent amount of power will cost him more than 2 billion. John didn't want to go down that route. He wanted to bring a single realistic character which could influence all and boost his yearly fan value earnings when the character is brought to life. He had plans to bring another world but it would take time. And he has enough patience to endure it. It's still two years before Thor comes to Earth and he would have enough time for bringing a suitable character. Till then he could bring low-budget characters to the world and influence the world more. It's just that he could not think of low-budget characters for now. As for now I don't need any characters. Only thing I lack is being sniped by a bullet as I wouldn't have enough time to change. I need a protection for that. For that only one movie comes to my mind. The VFX of this world has almost caught up with the movies of 2021. So it would be easier to make the movie. Let me call Bob. I need that movie soon John thought in his mind and called Bob to make a new movie. That year, 2008, Disney won the best animated movie again for Wally. -E. And this too like always was created by John. So in March he had to go LA to receive the Oscars again. John was bored of Oscars as every year he had to go and put up with people who he doesn't even know. His father and Val accompanied him for first two times. Later they just stopped. He cursed his luck as this time even Tony bailed on him saying he was moving to New York so he had work to do. Ha. Huh. Moving to New York is a big deal for him. All he does is lays around and Alfred running around. I miss the playboy Tony John lamented in his heart as stepped out of his car. Soon the reporters flocked towards him as usual. Sir you said that there will be a new Batman movie. Will it based on the fight that happened this year? A reporter asked. No. Of course no. This story will be based on his past like the previous one. John replied. Sir what are your plans for the future? What movies can we expect another reporter asked. There will be a space sci-fi movie soon and some movies which won't be produced by me. John replied and turned his head as he wanted to leave this torture soon but then he saw something that he would never forget in his entire life. He saw a woman of his age with burgundy hair color till her shoulders and wearing a black dress standing in a pose while the photographers taking her pictures. John was so mesmerized that he stopped for a second to appreciate the beauty. After a momentary daze, he took his eyes off as he was in public and couldn't be shameless enough to be labeled as someone who ogles at a woman. In all his life here he had seen many beautiful characters the famous Hollywood stars and beautiful girls all around who were trying to approach him, but he never cared. Firstly, he wasn't sure if he would survive the future. There are too many variables in his life and secondly he didn't have enough time to have any kind of romantic relationship with anyone. His father even urged him to go out with someone but he always refused. In his previous life he had a girlfriend but later they had to break up. It turned too much toxic at the end. He didn't want to repeat any such cycle. But the woman he saw just now was probably the woman of his dreams. In his previous life he watched all her movies and was a great fan of her. Both in movies and real life. She was the famous girl from Harry Potter movies, Emma Watson. 59 meeting her, too. After John came to this life he checked if there were movies from his previous life. He saw that there were Star Wars movies already been made and the Harry Potter books so he immediately removed these two worlds from his mind. So he never cared about it after that. Though John felt it was a huge loss especially the Star Wars movies but he accepted it. This was the first time he had seen Emma up close and she looked more beautiful in real than in real life. Even though she still looked quite young but her beauty was already apparent. John had a huge temptation to go and ask her for an autograph but finally thought better. I will ask for an autograph later. Then John went inside the gallery for the event. Soon everything played out like it was supposed to. He went to receive the Academy Award for the best animated movie. He thanked the audience and said that Disney will always continue producing animated movies as this was their legacy. After the award ceremony ended it was time for the Oscars party. Normally John always hated this event but today he was looking forward to it. He wanted this opportunity to ask for the autograph and see her up close. He was trembling inside thinking about it. 
After the party started, he met various stars and acted normally, but he kept an eye if Emma was free for him to approach. Finally he saw her free in a bar sitting by herself. Her age didn't allow her to drink in USA so she just sat there. Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint who came with her went for a dance after being invited to the dance floor by others. She was asked to but she rejected. Hello Miss Watson. Can I have an autograph? John said after he came near her in the most politest way possible for him. He was shaking inside in fear that she would reject him. Wow one of the biggest tycoons in the world is asking for my autograph. I should be honored she replied. I am your biggest fan so I couldn't stop myself from asking it. John replied with a smile. Sure I will give an autograph if you take a this seat. Emma said with a smile while pointing at the seat beside her. Sure Miss Watson, I would love to. John replied. You can call me Emma. I think we are of almost same age so I don't think that there should be much formality she said. Sure. You can call me John then. John said. How are you liking the party? John added. I will be honest, this is my first time attending such a huge party with glamour and shine. It's really not my liking. Emma said honestly. You do know that your answer will raise many eyebrows here if you say it out loud. John said with a straight face. I know but I don't really care. I believe you too don't like it that much. Emma replied. How well I too don't like it, but how did you guess that? John asked with interest. I guessed it. A celebrity like you almost don't generate any gossip. The only big gossip they could generate after years was Batman and evaluating if you are Batman. Such person generally don't like too much glamour. Even though you are a friend of Tony Stark but you are the exact opposite of him. She said after evaluation. I am impressed. Well not that impressed as I had already known you would be able to guess it. John said. It seems like you know about me. Tell me John, what do you guess about me? Emma asked. Not much actually. I just know you are kind, care about the planet and the people around. You want to change the world, especially for women who suffer all over the world due to injustice. John said after recalling her works in public in his previous life. This impressed Emma more as John was accurate to the point. I am thoroughly impressed John, I have to say. Emma replied. John thanked her for the compliment with a laugh. Would you like to dance with me? Emma finally said. Dance? But I actually don't know much about it. Forgive me if I make wrong steps. John replied as he honestly didn't know much about dancing. He only learned it a little after being forced by his father, as Jameson didn't want to shame John in public places such as this. It won't matter, I don't know much about it myself. Emma said sweetly. John felt he was living in dreams. He had never imagined of being able to have a dance with the famous Emma Watson. His heart was beating fast as he couldn't believe his luck. John took her hand and went to the dance floor and slowly started dancing with the slow music being played. He was way too much happy at that point of time and felt it was worthwhile of being transmigrating to the MCU. 60 The Second Trailer. You dance pretty decent. Emma said after dancing for few minutes. Thank you. I was just following your lead to be honest and praying that I don't step on your feet. John said with a laugh. They both realized that many eyes were on them as they were dancing. Emma felt a little shy as she noticed it. Seems like tomorrow the first gossip of you will come out. Emma said with a serious face. I never cared about their gossips and it's fine even if they come out with one. John said a little boldly this time. Emma blushed a little from this but didn't say anything. I want to ask a question. Emma asked after few seconds. Sure ask away John said. What does the tattoo in your hand mean? I have never seen such kind of tattoo before. It's not something satanic is it? Emma asked. You even noticed that? Well for now I can't say much about it. But it's nothing satanic or bad. Maybe one day I will explain its meaning. John said with a mysterious tone. One day? I hardly come to the States. I am not sure when we will meet next time. Emma said with a hint of regret. UMM we can exchange numbers if you feel like. John finally gathered up his courage and asked for it. Emma gave a very sweet smile to it and said. Sure. I will be looking forward to the explanation of your tattoos. After exchanging numbers and having a small talk they left after bidding farewell to each other. He even met the other two actors of Harry Potter and took their autographs too. They were surprised that John was a fan of Harry Potter but was happy about it. John returned the next day after the party and many entertainment tabloids really printed the news that he danced with Emma. John was surprised a bit but didn't pay much attention. After coming back he called Kevin and asked him about the progress of the Batman sequel. Everything is going fine. The movie will come out by the end of the year. Boss do you have any more project? Kevin asked John. As a matter of fact I do. Here is the script and related music required and general direction of the story. It's also a superhero movie and will be set in the same world as Batman's. John said. Same world as Batman. This raised an eyebrow of Kevin. Because Batman is actually real in this world, wouldn't it mean that this new superhero might actually exist? But Kevin didn't ask and went through the story. After reading the story Kevin was pretty sure that the story wasn't real as it was a story based on mythology. The months passed by pretty smoothly. After settling down in New York, Tony and Bruce even went to meet John for many times and had talks about future plans. He suggested some interesting things that helped them. They even discussed alchemy and the proposed fight happened between John and Tony finally happened. Tony was devastated at the end. Even though he chose the arena of metal but John's use of decomposition alchemy ruined all his attacks and on top of that he had to defend against John's fire attacks. 
John even practiced fighting with Bruce as John needed a proper coach in hand-to-hand -hand fights. His alchemy wasn't invincible and he needed experience. Bruce on the other hand went around New York City to clean trashes, especially places like Harlem and Hell's Kitchen. Wilson Fisk was rising very sharply so Bruce went into many of his locations and damaged many of his properties and illegal industries. The local gangs at the beginning didn't pay much attention but after they knew it was Batman's doing, many of them went into hiding. They didn't want to provoke someone who had high connections like John and Tony Stark. Even police turned a blind eye to Bruce's night vigil. Both John and Tony donate millions of dollars to the police department each year so they didn't want anything to do with Batman. By the end of the year the new trailer of sequel of Batman was out. It was called The Dark Knight. The trailer showed Joker being a person who wants to kill Batman and glimpses of his lunacy. John didn't reveal much in the trailer as he had very high hopes for the movie. Tony who was watching the trailer asked Bruce what's up with this Joker guy? Does he have any special powers? Special powers? No I don't know what's up with the Joker of the universe shown by John but the Joker in my universe is just a lunatic. A person who will do anything to achieve his goals. Bruce said coldly. Hmm interesting. Let's see what is up with this Joker guy. Let's hope he doesn't come to this universe. We have enough lunatics in this world. Tony said. 61 a brilliant idea. After the trailer went out John was relieved to see that there was a proper response from the audience and he was looking forward to its release on February of 2010. Before the release, for the post-production John went to the headquarters. The days of John recently have become boring. Apart from exchanging frequent calls and texts with Emma he was was bored out of his mind. To remove his boredom he even went to a short vacation in Australia to see if there were any ideas which could boost his yearly fan value earning. But sadly he was stuck. How is the production going on the new superhero movie? John asked Kevin in the meeting. Has there been any problems? No boss everything is fine. Kevin replied. Boss after years of animation making I was thinking if we could make a theme park based on the animated movies. We can buy a huge plot and make theme rides and other attractions Bob said in a low voice at the end. A Disney park? Sure. Why not John said without thinking but then suddenly an idea stuck his head. St. How could I forget this? Damn I have been a dumb guy. John almost shouted. All the people in the room was scared by his sudden outburst. Bob give me a pen and paper. I will write a new script for you. This upcoming movie will take our company to new heights John said with confidence. After writing a good few minutes about the general outline of the movie he gave it to Bob to read. Kevin too joined in reading and the story surprised everybody as it was totally a new kind of movie. Bob was excited to try this new adventure. Make it done by next year. The VFX must be as realistic as possible. I will give a better well-written script later. John said and got up for the meeting. John wanted to bring a new and cheap world. But a world that could influence a lot and raise his fan values. He went directly to Stark Tower as he had to do proper rituals for this new world. After arriving he went to the laboratory where Tony and Bruce were working on new armor. John could already guess what the new armor will be. Tony's armor in Avengers movie, Mark 7. Hey Tony I need your help. We need to buy an island. John said directly to Tony. Island? What do we need an island for? Tony said skeptically. Bruce too heard about it and joined. Because a new world is going to merge and we can commercialize it. I have already given a movie script to it. People are going to love it. John said with excitement. New world? Like Naruto's? Won't it be dangerous? Tony said. Tony had some fear when it came to Naruto's world. He still didn't have any idea of how he would face the cages level. No Tony it will be fine. With your help and technology we can control this new world with our own hands. Buy an island which is away from mainland and make sure we have full rights of the island with no country interfering. John said. Sure but what is this new world about? Tony asked again. A world of dinosaurs. John said with a huge smile. What? Dinosaurs? Won't humanity be in danger due to it? Tony exclaimed. No Tony the world which the dinosaurs will come from is a modern world. People in that world have made huge advancement in gene technology and were able to make dinosaurs with just using the genes of old dinosaurs and putting it into animals. They made a theme park out of it. We can make one too John said. From gene technology to making dinosaurs? That's a new idea. Would love to go through this new technology. Tony said with gleam in his eyes. We should make sure that the island is safe. Having a millions years of old era will come with conditions. We will have to balance the ecology Bruce finally said after listening to the conversation. That is for sure. We will need biologists. If only Bruce Banner was around. I will tell Pepper to do necessary arrangements. I heard there will be a space sci-fi movie soon. Will that world come too? Tony said after calming down. The space movie? Well not for now but some random technology might arrive. I will be in the lookout. John said after thinking. The new sci-fi movie was arriving at the end of the year. Tony too was looking forward to any new technology that might arrive as John suggested. John went back home after discussing the plans for the theme park Pepper 2 joined the meeting and everybody pitched their ideas of how to control the dinosaurs and number of people that will be required. Everybody was excited for seeing dinosaurs in real life. Even though John said that it will take quite a bit of time for their merge, almost all were excitedly waiting for it. 62 The movie, The Dark Knight was finally released on December 22, 2009. And everybody known to John was called for the premiere. 
This time the premiere was held in New York instead of LA John even invited Emma and the main crew of Harry Potter but they were busy with their shooting of Deathly Hollows, so they had to reject at the end. John thought it was a pity but didn't pay much heed. Now almost every day he and Emma exchanged video calls. John really felt he was the luckiest person alive as the relationship between him and Emma was progressing steadily and they actually had many things in common. Tony and Bruce too came for the movie and sat beside him in the theater. The movie began. Several masked men appeared on the big screen, in everyone's field of vision. With a few simple exchanges everyone knew that this was a group of robbers, and the only person named, the Joker, is the planner of the robbery. In the eyes of other robbers, this was a guy who sat high up. In other words, the clown was not among these people. The robbery went smoothly. Dare to plan the robbery of the gang bank, revealed the madness of the clown. In the process of unlocking, where is the kid who broke the alarm, said one robber in clown mask. The boss said, after he got it done, finish him off? One less person to divide the money, right, said the other guy. It's a coincidence, he said the same to me. What? No, no. Boom. Companions cannibalized each other. Bags of money were taken to the gate. The robber who had killed before took the gun and pointed at the only other accomplice. The clown told you that after the money is filled, you need to kill me, right? One less person to divide the money, right? No, no, he asked me to kill the bus driver. Bus? What bus driver? As soon as the voice fell, a bus crashed into the bank gate, knocking the talking robber out. This guy looks out of breath, it's time to go, said the last guy left to the bus driver. What about the rest? The bus driver jumped out of the car and looked around in surprise, not at all ashamed of killing a companion. The remaining robber shot without hesitation and killed the bus driver. Do you think you are smart, said the bank manager who was shot before because he tried to be a hero. He was laying on the ground unable to move. The people who pay for you will make you end up like them. The former bad guys were very principled, honorable, respectful. Look at you, what do you believe in? Hearing this, the robber looked at the man curled up on the ground, strolling in front of him and squatting down, looking directly into his eyes, and slowly said, I believe whatever doesn't kill you, simply makes you, stranger. He took off the mask, his green hair scattered around his ears, revealing the face of a circus joker, his skin was pale, his mouth was painted with big red lipstick, and the corners of his mouth had deep, knife-cut scars. The joker appeared. Everyone in front of the big screen was slightly taken aback. Everyone realized that this clown should be the villain that Batman will deal with in the Dark Knight. However, now it seems that the clown does not have any extraordinary abilities. Compared with the previous villain, the master of Batman, and the master of assassins, the Joker is more insidious and cunning, and seems unable to pose any threat to Batman. The long-lost Batman finally came out. In a drugs trade, the Batman in the movie was like a hunter, driving a Batmobile and sweeping all the bad guys. Director Gordon appeared, went to the robbed gang bank, and walked into the vault. After a few words with the assistant, Batman appeared beside them. Gordon sent his assistant away and showed Batman the picture of the Joker. It's him again. Batman's tone was low. Who else? A gang of mobs. Gordon replied. During their exchanges, another character appeared, the newly appointed prosecutor. Harvey Dent. He and Batman's childhood sweetheart Rachel became a couple. Harvey had always admired Batman and hoped to take this responsibility from Batman. The police and prosecutors seized the bank with traceable banknotes, only to find themselves being mocked. In the party of gangsters, the Joker once again appeared with a proposal but was mocked instead. The guy in charge of money laundering fled back to Hong Kong, and after discussing with Gordon and Harvey, Batman decided to go to Hong Kong to capture this guy. With brand new equipment, jumped from a high building. The hang gliding wings spread out, flying around the building, like a real bat. Wow, Bruce, you and him have so much similarity with the bat so Tony laughed as he said to Bruce in a hushed tone. Bruce didn't say anything. Finally, the Joker took action. The Joker's conspiracy against Batman also began to show up in front of everyone. The body of a man posing as Batman was hung at the window of the Dawes office building. At the same time, a video was posted on the internet. Do you think Batman makes Gotham better? Look, this is how crazy Batman made Gotham. Batman must take off his mask and surrender. As long as he doesn't surrender, someone will die every day. I am a man of my word, ha 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 ha. The audience felt chills when they heard the laughter of the clown. They finally realized the horror of the clown. This was a lunatic who is distorted enough in his heart to completely ignore order and social morality. At the political fundraising party organized by Bruce Wayne about the new prosecutor, Harvey Dent, the Joker appeared again and even had a confrontation with Batman. Under the leadership of the Joker, the villains of Gotham City united, and Batman was gradually forced into desperation. The main theme of this film also began to show up in front of all audiences. In the movie, people realized that power wasn't everything. Some people just wanted to watch the world burn. He was a special villain, not interested in logical things, such as money. Buying, threats, reasoning, and negotiation all do not work. The Joker was just for fun. The appearance of Batman made him feel that he had found the best object of fun. In the movie Harvey used himself as a bait, hoping to catch the Joker. He succeeded. The Joker was arrested by the police and Batman. Then at night Gordon received a call that Harvey was missing. He immediately went to the prison and found the Joker, and Batman arrived at the same time. Here is what the audience is most looking forward to. Batman and Joker's head-to-head -head confrontation. 
You want to see me, I'm here. Batman punched the table in front of the Joker, giving the Joker a warning first. I want to see what you are going to do, you really did not let me down. Batman, you let five people die because of you, and then let Harvey Dent take the blame for you, even in the eyes of people like me, it's too cold-blooded. The Joker was talking, but was forcibly interrupted by the impatient Batman. Where is Harvey? There is no turning back, you changed everything. The Joker laughed, madly you, you complete me. 63 a new superhero. Batman asked about the location of Harvey in a threatening voice and Joker gave a choice of saving Rachel or Harvey. Batman chose Harvey to save while Gordon went for Rachel. But Gordon was not able to save Rachel. Joker in the meantime managed to escape from prison. Harvey whose half of the face was burnt was found by Joker and pushed him into insanity. Harvey went insane and started hunting all people who weren't able to save Rachel and who colluded with the gang and did bad things. Even Batman himself crossed ethical lines and hacked into every mobile to find the location of Joker. At the end Joker played a game again. A choice was given to two boats, one with civilian and other with prisoners. They had to blow the other boat with a switch because if they didn't Joker would blow them up instead. And Joker for the first time failed to manipulate the people and was caught by Batman. In the other scene Harvey caught the family of Gordon. When Harvey was going to kill Gordon, Batman came and killed Harvey. We need to say the truth to people of Harvey Gordon said to Batman. No, Harvey will remain an image of justice. I will bear the burden of crime Batman said without any hesitation. But you will be hunted down. Gordon said. I am not a hero, I am whatever Gotham needs me to be, sometimes truth isn't good enough, Batman said and ran away, people finally understood why the movie was named as Dark Knight, he was a force who operated in shadows, people felt sympathy for him, even Nick Fury and Coulson who watched the movie felt bad for Batman, his sacrifices were immense, the credits rolled and soon the post credit scene came out, it showed present day Paris, France, a woman walking towards the Louvre Museum while narrating from background, I used to want to save the world, this beautiful place, but I was naive. The closer you get, the more darkness you will see. As the woman entered her office a black suitcase arrived with Wayne Enterprises written in bold characters on it. She opened the suitcase to see a very old picture. The picture had four soldiers standing side by side in a damaged battlefield. And then there was a woman standing in the middle. The thing was the woman in the picture looked exactly the same as the one holding the picture. She smiled after seeing the picture. The audience understood that Batman knows this mysterious woman but the people didn't understand why these two women look the same. Tony looked at Bruce for a few seconds and said, You know this woman. Bruce didn't reply to Tony but asked John is she coming. I don't know. I just saw her in my dreams. I have no idea if she would be transferred. John said. Bruce didn't say anything to it but remained silent and closed his eyes as if thinking of something. The movie got a standing ovation. This was a movie which didn't hesitate to show how society treated superheroes when something went wrong. The movie was based on a bold theme and made people realize that being a hero comes with responsibility. Nick and Coulson approached John after they came out. They wanted to know if this woman will appear. John answered the same as he had done to Bruce. John didn't want to reveal too much of his powers. Too much revelation would be prone to mistakes. He wanted to keep a sense of mystery. I want to know to more of this character Fury said at the end as he felt he needed to know more about this woman. Why in a hurry? Even if she comes it will be in much further in the future. You will know her from the movie. John said. Nick could always pressurize John for more information but he didn't want to. He even didn't put any spy in Disney. John had always said he has glimpses of future in his dreams in other universes. He didn't want to take any risk and maintain a goodwill. They went back after the movie ended and John received a message while riding Bumblebee. How was the movie? Sorry I couldn't attend the premiere. John just smiled after reading and replied it's fine. I will come for the Deathly Hollows part 1 premiere though. Reserve a seat for me. Sure Emma replied with a smiley face. The months went by gradually after the release of the movie. The movie earned a lot in box office and was critically acclaimed with a very rating. Even though it didn't much boost his fan values by much as it was only a Batman movie but this movie was necessary for his future plans and appeal to the public. 64 3 movies. Almost a year had gone by after the Dark Knight movie. Disney had scheduled three movies at the end of the year. So there was a lot of work for John in the following months. In the meantime Tony with the help of Pepper had already bought a big island in the Caribbean Sea and made sure no country nearby could touch his property. Of course John too invested money in it. It was an easy cash grab anyway. Soon the first movie of the three was released in late October. It was a space sci-fi movie. In a futuristic world where mankind has conquered the known universe, it was ruled by an emperor and had various houses spread across the universe helping the emperor maintain peace and order. Mankind used a thing called spices to travel across galaxies and this spice was only available in a single planet. Before, the planet was under a different house and suddenly the emperor decided to change the house. Basically it was a political plot. John shot this movie for its shield technology. Apparently anything with high velocity couldn't penetrate the shield, be it a bullet or a missile. Yes. The movie was Dune. John wanted this technology for protection from possible assassinations later. Much later he might even think of bringing out their spaceships by spending fan values. The movie premiered and people loved the movie. American people had a deep love for drama and political plots and this movie basically had everything. Ding. 
Total fan value, 1.2 billion. Fan value required to bring House of Atreides to life, 1 billion. Fan value required to bring House of Harkonnen to life, 1 billion. Fan value required for shielding technology, 400 million. Thank God there is a shielding technology otherwise I would have to spend a billion for a stupid technology. Still it's 400 million. One year of savings will be gone. Well I hope it will be worth it. Extract the shielding technology John said after seeing his panel. Jurassic Park World will cost me another 100 million. Sigh, if this goes on I will be broke soon. After the movie John followed Tony to Stark Tower. He needed Tony to research on shielding technology. Bruce has a home now in New York, thanks to his shares of Stark Industries that John shared with him. Bruce who came to the movie also came to Stark Tower with them as John asked for it. John after reaching to Tony's place said while bringing out a memory stick. I have the shielding technology in this stick. I want both of you to research but on conditions. John said. Tony almost jumped in his seat when he heard it. Bruce too had a rare interested face when he heard it. What condition? I can give away half my shares if you give me this stick. Tony said with excitement. John shrugged his head and the said. No I want only you both to research on it. Nothing of the data will be placed in a server which can be accessed by internet. Even Jarvis can't get access to the data. All the shielding equipment will not be mass produced until I say so. John said. Huh? No access. You think somebody will hack into Jarvis and steal it again? Tony asked. John didn't say anything and looked at him. Okay fine I accept the proposal. Now give it to me. It will be weird going old school on such a high technology. Bruce this will need your help. Tony said. By the way the Jurassic World is coming soon. Next month I will guide them to the island from my dreams. You will have to take care of the rest. Are all the cages and personnel ready? John asked. Yes. You can send them. I won't be attending the premiere for the Jurassic Park movie. I will be there on Jurassic Park to see firsthand the dinosaurs. I hope they won't be late after the movie is released as I have work to do. Tony said as he too named his island as Jurassic Park. Sure. Even I won't be there in the premiere. I will travel to London next month. John said as he promised to be there for the premiere due Deathly Hollows. He was excited to see her again after a long time. Soon Tony and Bruce started working on the shielding technology. And John left for his home and gave the other two space to work on the new technology. After a couple of weeks John got ready to go to London. As B landed on the airport from his private plane he saw Emma waiting for him. He was delighted to see her. He came down and hugged her saying. You look as lovely as ever. Thank you. You look great too. How was the flight? Emma asked. It was fine. Slept all the way. Let's go to the hotel. John said. After they went to the hotel, John freshened up and was ready to go out. Emma had decided to go for a small tour around London showing him this historic city. John too followed her. They had a great time together and the tour ended with a fine dinner in a restaurant. This was their first official date and John had booked a great restaurant which had privacy. Even though he was sure he had been taken pictures of during his tour of the city, he still wanted privacy when it came to the date. 65 3 movies, 2. They had a great talk during the dinner date and had fun. John and Emma both felt very happy about their first date. They both had so much to talk that they passed more than 3 hours in the date. It must be fun having superheroes as friends. Emma said. Actually no, they are just normal people with weirder past. Nothing much. John said. Can I meet Bruce one day? He looks so cool in the movie. Emma asked with expectation. Bruce? Sure. I trust you so he will be fine with it. Emma was really happy when she heard that. After the dinner John left for the hotel with Emma. The hotel was cozy and John had booked a presidential suite. He took her to his room and had the night to remember for both John and Emma. It was the first of such night for John as he never had any relationship with anyone in this world. The next day they went for the premiere. Of course they didn't go to the premiere together as both of them felt that it would be too soon to show their relationship in public even though there was a gossip now in the media. In the meantime, Jurassic Park was already released and this time two people loved it. But what came as a shock to people that the Jurassic Park actually existed. Tony uploaded a video of him showing around Jurassic Park in the internet. Welcome to Jurassic Park. I don't think I will have to explain what Jurassic Park is. The movie by my friend John is explanatory enough. If you and your family needs a vacation that you can remember for lifetime. If you want to go for an adventure with your girlfriend. This is the one. Come to Jurassic Park. And don't worry about the safety reasons. Stark Industries will provide state of the art security for it. Tony gave a long speech. Soon the respective media channels inquired about the authenticity and asked for access to the park. They were given permission without any hindrance. Within a week this caused an uproar in the world. Everybody wanted to visit this island and they were ready to spend money for it. John insisted on keeping the ticket price as minimum as possible as he didn't want money from it. And only reasonable price will appeal to the people and help him getting more fans. This boosted his fan values by a lot. He earned more than 100 million fan values within a month. Even Emma was interested in it. John promised to take her to it after she becomes free from the Harry Potter series. The premiere for the Harry Potter went well but the reporters who saw him in the premiere only asked questions about Jurassic Park. John got shy about it because he felt this was the platform of Harry Potter, not Jurassic Park. So he replied only one answer and escaped from them. The movie was exactly the same as his previous life so he knew the whole plot. 
After staying in London for two more days John returned to New York. He was little sad of leaving Emma but he knew this was temporary. It was late December when the last scheduled movie was supposed to be out. This movie was his tactics of managing the plot of Thor. Even though he could bring Naruto's world and deal with it but he wanted to keep Naruto hidden for now. Only during New York War he will show a glimpse. John understood that if he showed his hand too much Thanos might accelerate his plans. He didn't want any such intervention now. He wanted to follow the original plot and become powerful enough to overthrow gods. Only then he could be at peace and show all his hands. The movie premiered on December 15th at New York. Everybody came to attend the movie including Carlson and Nick. The movie started with the same scene as was in the post credit scene of Batman, she being in the office of Louvre Museum and seeing a very old photo. But this time there was scene where there was a note attached to it written I found the original. Maybe one day you will tell me the story. No wonder you never told me anything about the story. You yourself don't know. Tony laughed at Bruce who sat beside him and John. Bruce shrugged but didn't say anything. The story told about a small girl living in an enclosed island where only women lived in it which was protected by the magical enchantment of Zeus. The story told about gods and mankind and their struggles in facing Ares, the god of war. Gradually, the small girl grew up among the women but she knew she was little bit different from other women. One fine day, an airplane crashed near the island and this woman named Diana Prince went and saved the man who crashed with the airplane. The airplane looked like it belonged to World War I. 66 Thor. Soon the women of the island came to know about the war which was raging outside from the man who crashed near the island. His name was Steve Trevor. Carlson felt, being a huge fan of Steve Rogers, that this person's name and Captain America's name was almost same. Diana wanted to participate in the war as she felt it was the work of Ares who instigated the war but was denied. At the end she left sneakily from the Amazon island while taking away the so-called godkiller weapon and the lasso of truth. As Diana dealt with mankind she saw the horrors of mankind and what wars did. As the story progressed Diana and Steve were thrown into a war zone where no sides were able to cross and overwhelm the other side. Diana single-handedly won the battle and helped taking over. It was the first time the audience saw her in action. Jesus, how powerful is this woman? Tony exclaimed. More powerful than you think. Bruce replied. This was where the old picture was taken after they won the battle with other comrades who joined her in this mission. The movie soon came to the end where Diana had to confront Ares. It was then she realized that the godkiller wasn't a weapon but her. Being the daughter of Zeus himself and Queen Hippolyta. Steve died in a plane explosion while trying to stop the bombing. Carlson here again felt that it was the same as Captain America. There was a huge fight between her and Ares where Diana finally embraced that she was the daughter of Zeus and killed her brother. John made sure to even copy the music from the original movie and added into it. The audience loved the movie but they weren't sure how Batman was involved in this. Gods. Are they real? Tony said at the end. Very real Tony. Very much real. John said. How is the shielding technology progressing? John added changing the topic. I hope we don't have enemy among gods like Ares. It won't be good. The technology will take some time but I am optimistic about it. Tony said solemnly. The credits rolled and soon the post-credits scene came out. It showed a man in airplane fighter suit on a simulated environment. The pilot was conducting dangerous maneuvers which ultimately led to the crash of the plane. But since it was a simulated environment nothing really happened. But as he was going out of the room where he was doing his practice he saw he was no longer in the place he was supposed to be and was instead flying in air along with the room. The whole boundary of the room was covered in green. The room along with him inside flew to a certain location. There was strange alien looking man lying blood in a green suit. You really do know everything about us. Bruce said after looking at John. John just smiled and said nothing. Wait there are aliens in your world. Dios mio, if God wasn't enough there are aliens too. Tony said. They all came out after the movie ended. Nick didn't say anything to John but instead asked Carlson to research on theology. Carlson wanted a proper knowledge on all gods in all religious beliefs. The existence of gods in another universe made him believe that there might be gods in their own universe. The movie was critically acclaimed too as it was the first movie to show a woman as a superhero. This was a refreshing take over the fact that only men could be superheroes in movies. John got quite a decent amount of fan values out of it. Ding. Total fan values, 1 billion. Fan value required for bringing the character Wonder Woman to life slash changing to the character, 210 million. Extract the character. John commanded. Ding. Character extracted. Remaining fan values, 800 million. The stage is set. In a few months Thor will enter Earth. Odin you are really not good in educating children. John thought as he was driving home. How was the response? Was it good? Came a text. It was great. Should have let you be the heroine. Might have been better. Next premiere you are coming with me. John replied back. She immediately video called and had a chat with Emma. John spoke happily with her as he reached home. Soon the months went by as John accumulated more fan values thanks to movies, anime, cartoons, and of course the new attraction the Jurassic Park. It catapulted his fan values to 550 million per year. John even kept tabs on Dr. Jane Foster, Dr. Eric Selvig and even found out information on Darcy Lewis, the intern of Jane. By April of 2011, John got the information from Fixit that Jane had traveled to New Mexico. Even though he didn't spy on them, he did have the itinerary of them. 
He got ready to go to New Mexico as he wanted to see the promised prince himself. 67 Sitwell. John soon reached Puente Antiguo, the town where it all started for Thor and Jane. He didn't know if Thor had reached or not but he had started visiting every diner from morning to evening to check if Thor, Jane, and others visited. He even checked hospital to see if Thor was there but still couldn't find. It went on for four days before finally in a morning he saw Jane, Thor, Darcy, and Dr. Eric coming inside the diner. Thor looked more handsome in real life than in the movies. John felt sadness when he looked at Thor. The supposed king lost his all in his journey. His mother, his father, his brother, and even Asgard. No wonder he went to depression by Avengers, Endgame. John hoped to change some of his future. As John was thinking of all this, Thor and others had started eating. It was astonishing of how Thor could eat in one sitting. As he was eating Thor spoke about Asgard, Bifrost and other things. Of course they didn't believe him. But Jane kept looking at him. She was already smitten by Thor. John smiled to himself because he too probably has the same look as her when he sees Emma. After Thor made the famous scene of smashing the cup he was drinking, more customers came and started speaking of a satellite. Jane inquired about this crashed satellite and found out that there was a crashed satellite 50 miles west. Thor immediately got ready to go out. The others followed out. John too followed them as he needed to insert himself. As Thor wanted their help to take him to the crashed satellite, Eric took the other two girls aside and said. Please don't do this. You saw what I saw. We need to find out what's in that crater. Jane refuted. He is delusional. Listen to what he is saying. He is talking of Njolnir, Thor, and Bifrost. It's the stories I grew up as a child. He is dangerous. Eric said. John finally couldn't hold it and inserted himself. He isn't delusional. Whatever he says is 100% real. You are. Eric suddenly became defensive. Even Thor who was listening to the conversation looked at John with curiosity. Hello, I am John Jameson. It's nice to meet you Dr. Eric, Dr. Jane, and Darcy. John said. Oh my god. You are that John. Are you for real? Darcy almost screamed. Yes I am as real as I can be. Hello Thor Odinson, it's not every day I get to meet a prince. John said. It seems like you know me quite well. Thor said with little curiosity as this new person must have followed him, knew him, and even believed him while the other three never believed any words of him from beginning. John just smiled to it. We should go to this crater. Many of your questions will be answered. Don't worry Dr. Selvig, the people who took over the crater are my friends. They won't stop or harass us. John said. Darcy and Jane were delighted. Darcy felt that this was her ticket to get to know a ultra-rich guy and maybe take a leap in her career while Jane felt that many questions would be answered. Eric finally gave in to persuasion. They decided to take their truck to the crater. As Thor and everybody went back to take their crater they saw men in suit taking away stuff from the lab of Jane. Hey you can't take this. These are all mine. Jane shouted. Maybe it was his butterfly effect but the person who came to take away Jane's belongings wasn't Carlson but Sitwell, an agent of Hydra. Sorry ma'am. I am Agent Sitwell from S.H.I.E.L.D. We are investigating a threat, we need to appropriate and record all your data. Sitwell replied. It was John this time who replied. Agent Sitwell, where is Carlson? You are. You are John Jameson. Hello Mr. Jameson. It's nice to meet you. But we need to take the equipment for security reasons. Sitwell said after recognizing John. John was famous all over the world, so most agents knew about him. It's just very few people knew about his consultant status with S.H.I.E.L.D. I know who you are. Call Carlson. It's rude to take others' stuff without getting a permission. Even if it's S.H.I.E.L.D. John said with authority. We have orders from Superior to take away the belongings. Even Carlson won't be able to stop this Sitwell said getting a little annoyed this time. He didn't expect to see such a big player here out of nowhere. It made him more suspicious of the things Jane had now. He wanted to retrieve all the things more urgently now. Superior, do you want me to call Fury? I am sure he will delighted to receive a lawyer's call due to the ignorance of an agent. John said with a smile. Sir you can't do this. S.H.I.E.L.D. has authority and power to confiscate anything that might be a threat to Earth. Sidwell was more adamant now to take away the things. So Fury it is then. John said as his hands went to his pocket to bring out his mobile. As soon as he did that the agents around who were looking at him took out their guns and pointed at him. 68 The Demigod. Everybody got scared by this move except for Thor. Thor didn't have a notion of guns from Earth and he felt no weapon of Earth could threaten him. John raised his eyebrows when he saw this action. Sitwell, you and your agents should lower your guns. I don't like being threatened. John said in a cold tone. His expression showing no fear whatsoever. Eric took both the woman behind him. Eric knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. was a big thing but he also very well knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. wouldn't be stupid enough to shoot at John. S.H.I.E.L.D. won't be able to cover up if anything happened to John. Sir you should allow us to do our jobs. It will be better that way. Sidwell replied with a smile. Sigh, what a headache. John said with a bland tone. As soon as he said that a shining long rope tied around Sitwell, making Sitwell stiff in his place. The agents got frightened by this action and turned their head towards the direction from where the rope came from. Only to see a woman in a red golden armor walking towards them while holding the rope. She had metal bands in her feet, hands, and even on her head which was in the shape of V. All the agents trembled in their feet as they recognized who she was. S.H.I.E.L.D. had a policy to watch all works of John so that if someday they cross path in the future with some of the characters of John's works, they would be able to take proper action. 
The agents knew who they were facing against. A demigod, daughter of Zeus. As the agents were pointing the guns at Diana, she walked towards them. One agent finally couldn't hold it together and shot at her. Diana deflected the bullet by her bangle easily. All agents immediately knew that she was the real deal. Some agents started firing at her. She ran fast towards the agents and started knocking them out. Her attacks were powerful but not fatal enough to kill them. The agents couldn't even respond properly as she was too fast and bullets were always deflected by her bangles. Thor and others were astonished by seeing her. Jane and Eric didn't even know who she was. Only Darcy knew as she was a big fan of superhero, but she couldn't believe that such a character was real. The notion of a demigod shook her beliefs. Though Eric and Jane knew about Batman they didn't have much interest as they were scientists and superhero genre weren't up their alley. Even though Thor lost his powers but he could feel that this woman was powerful. For the first time there was seriousness in his face. Sidwell was still stuck in the lasso of truth and standing still. When he saw Diana knocking out everybody his eyes went wide. He knew he was done for. All he could pray was that she wouldn't kill her. John didn't even look at Sitwell and others but said to Diana who came towards him slowly. How was the journey? Lot of bumps on the way. No it was fine. Took me time to realize where I am. Saw Bruce on a poster. And me too. Felt a similar power to my world here, so wanted to pay a visit she replied. John smiled to that. He wanted to give vague hints to the agents, who didn't shoot at her, by this conversation in order to misdirect them. The other agents who were trembling on their knees heard their conversation. Since John had lied from beginning, John needed to maintain that lie onward. John took out the mobile and called Carlson to come to his location. Carlson was surprised that John was in New Mexico. He immediately left from the base near the crater. Truth to be told, John really wanted to kill Sitwell and other Hydra agents here. He was angry with them guns pointing guns at him. But John also knew if does this, it would complicate things and Hydra might just hide away forever. Pierce wasn't the problem, the problem was the other heads of Hydra. It would then take forever to search for them. After few minutes Carlson reached only to see few agents standing beside and Sitwell tied in a shining rope. When Carlson saw Diana he recognized her immediately. He knew that something happened between Sitwell and Diana and he needed to remedy the situation carefully or he might have to listen to Fury. Hello John, can I know what happened? Carlson asked as he saw Sitwell tied in a rope and many agents lying on the floor unconscious, some were even bleeding. He knew this was bad news. Agent Sitwell threatened me with a gun and so did all these agents. Diana was passing by so she taught them a lesson John shrugged. Carlson heart skipped a beat. Even though John never said anything and was almost invisible to all but Fury had once told him that John was the most dangerous as he might be hiding more characters behind him. It was fine if it was from John's works but if some characters who S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't know had already entered and had contact with John it might be very dangerous. The existence of Naruto's world itself was like a sword pointing at them. He didn't want to make a potential super-powered enemy out of John. Actually it wasn't the total fault of Sitwell. He didn't know the consultant position of John. This secret was only accessible to level 10 agents and Carlson. So basically he was just following orders, it's just that he didn't think properly before threatening John. What the hell Sitwell? Do you even know who you are threatening? Do you want S.H.I.E.L.D. to be on the verge of destruction? Carlson shouted. Sitwell just stood by and kept his head down. He knew he made a huge mistake. He might even be reprimanded by Pierce. Hydra still wasn't powerful enough to show its face and making an enemy out of a demigod was a huge mistake. 69 Jalnir. Miss Diana Prince, hello, I am Agent Carlson. I am really sorry for my colleague's behavior. I hope you can leave him. Carlson said to Diana politely. Diana looked at Carlson for few seconds and then looked at John. John nodded his head. She loosened her lasso and took it back. Sitwell fell down from his standing position sweating. If before she didn't believe in gods, now he definitely believed. He thought only Naruto's world was special but now he had changed his mindset. Being bounded by the lasso almost made him like a statue and he couldn't do anything, not even move an inch. Thank you, Miss Diana. I am an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. is responsible for any extraordinary threats faced by Earth. I hope we can cooperate in the future. Carlson continued. Diana didn't reply to that. Eric and everybody who were watching was very confused. They didn't understand what was going on. John finally said we should all sit down and talk. The equipment that were supposed to take away was returned and Jane was happy about it. Finally they all sat down, including Thor even though he wanted to to go and take the hammer away. John convinced him that after the talks they will go for his hammer. John introduced Diana to Eric and Jane and explained them about her origin. They were dumbfounded as they couldn't believe that the gods were real. Then they looked at Thor and remembered what John said at the beginning about Thor not being delusional. You are really Thor? Then why aren't you powerful? Darcy couldn't help but ask with skepticism. Mortal? How dare you say that? I am a god, I was born powerful. Thor roared. Carlson who did recent study on theology understood who Thor was. The god of thunder from Norse mythology. The hammer in the crater probably belonged to him but he couldn't understand why was the weapon so far away from him. And John hadn't made a movie out of Thor so it meant that the Norse mythology already existed from in this universe since ancient times. After seeing so many weird things, Carlson accepted this new information with open arms. He just felt Earth was vulnerable and needed more protection. So Thor you have heard about Diana. What do you think? Are there really gods in this realm? 
Thor with curiosity now as he heard saying Diana was a daughter of a god. I have never seen myself as a god. Maybe a powerful being. But never thought myself as a god. Neither are you Thor. Diana replied. Thor was stunned by this but he didn't know how to answer. Odin too used to say the same thing but never paid attention to it. Thor wanted to know about Diana but he needed to take up his hammer. It's fine Diana. Thor, you can ask about Diana later. Shall we go now? Thor is already fidgeting to get his beloved hammer back. John said as he got up. They went in the car of shield and traveled towards the crater. Jane was excited about it. She saw her whole perspective of world change and wanted to know more about Thor and it added to the fact that she was smitten by Thor. Jane and Thor talked along the way. John was happy to see it as he felt the universe corrected itself here in this regard. They reached the destination and Thor went in immediately. We all should take shelter. It's going to rain soon. John said as he saw Thor almost running towards the direction of the hammer. Soon there was an electromagnetic surge from the hammer as Thor came near Mjolnir. He was happy to see his hammer again. He then proceeded to lift the hammer. But no matter how he tried he couldn't. John and everyone looked at Thor as he was getting drenched in the rain. Hello Clint, I heard you went to that world. How was the experience? John said as he saw Hawkeye from the corner of his eye. You know me. Clint was surprised by John's advance. Of course I know. I too have friends there John smiled at him. Oh no wonder. It was good. Doubted my own ability for the first time Clint said with a hint of sadness. John said ha ha ha. It's fine. You two are powerful. All right. We don't want Thor to get cold. Take him to a secluded room and let him think about his mistakes. Mistakes? Did Thor commit any mistake? Jane was concerned so asked John. Yes he did. It's Thor's private matter. You can ask him yourself. For now let him be in silence. John didn't want to intervene the upcoming conversation between him and Loki. It was important for Thor to realize his mistake. Thor was taken away in a room while others went away to another place as John asked them to give him space. As the original plot Loki did come to meet Thor to say that Odin died due to sadness of Thor's banishment and there was a truce with Jotunheim on the condition that Thor remained exiled here. Of course it was a lie. As Loki went to meet Thor, John, and others were talking among themselves. Eric and Jane asked questions from Diana about gods. Darcy had already told her story to the two scientists so they were very interested about Diana too. John noticed that Diana flinched for a second. Is he here? John asked Diana. Yes he is here. Seventy being worthy. Huh? What are you both talking about? Who is here? Jane asked as she heard this conversation. Nothing? Just talking about a friend. John replied trying to deflect the topic. Is there another person from another universe? Carlson who too heard their conversation asked. No. Just a person of interest. John denied it. You will see him when the time is right. Carlson didn't force to know more as it would be useless. So Carlson ordered the agents to be on the lookout for a suspecting individual. John and others stayed in their place as Jane and Eric continued to ask more information. Darcy was more interested in John. Her enthusiasm was too overwhelming even for John but he was polite as in future she has a role during the event of WandaVision. After few minutes of talking with them John said. Let's go to meet him. He might have calmed down now. John said at the end. They went to the room where Thor was staying put while Diana and John went to check Mjolnir to see if Loki was trying to pick up the hammer. As they came to the place that Loki was not there, probably he had already left after trying for few seconds. Loki knew better that no matter how hard he tried he wouldn't be able to lift the hammer if he wasn't worthy. Carlson too followed them after making sure there was nobody was in the premises. John really was amazed by the magic of Loki. His illusions were really powerful as he never got noticed. Do you want to try picking it up? John said to Diana. Sure, why not? Diana said and the next moment she jumped from the ramp towards the hammer. She touched Mjolnir for few seconds but there was no reaction. John felt maybe she wasn't worthy as there was no environmental reaction like the time when Thor tried to lift the hammer. But the very next moment as she tried picking the hammer, it was easily lifted up. Everybody who was watching her were surprised. All this time almost all agents tried to lift it up but couldn't even move a centimeter and now there is a woman who could easily lift it up. Carlson was stuck for a second but accepted the fact because he felt only gods can handle other gods. Humans were still weak. Do you feel anything different? John asked. I can now use electricity to fight. But in a more better way than when I fought Ares. This hammer is terribly well balanced. Diana lamented. Heimdall who just had a chat with the new King Loki was dumbfounded for a second. It's been years when he started seeing weird beings appearing in Midgard. He even informed Odin about it but Odin only said not to worry about it. Now he saw a woman who could lift the hammer. He wondered if this woman would be the new queen of Iskrad if she came to claim the throne. Diana looked at the hammer for few seconds and left it in its place. Carlson was surprised by it and asked. Don't you want to use it as a weapon? Hammer is not my kind of weapon. My lasso is enough. Plus, it belongs to someone else. By the way don't tell Thor about it. Diana said. Carlson now really appreciated Diana. If what they said was real and this hammer was really very powerful it was commendable that she wasn't tempted by its power. Then again she herself was a god with a powerful weapon. After few more minutes of talking and lingering around, Jane and others decided to go back to their place. Thor didn't have a home in Earth so accepted Jane's proposal of going back with them. John too left with Diana to a nearby hotel as there would be a fight soon nearby. 
Even though John won't fight as he didn't want to expose his alchemy powers to S.H.I.E.L.D. but still he would watch it. In the meantime Sitwell called Pierce and told him about the emergence of Diana and Thor. One Naruto world was scary enough now there are gods. Sitwell wasn't sure of how to handle it. Sir I propose that we should assassinate John. He is a variable for us. Sitwell said, are you a fool? The people of Naruto world are dangerous enough, we have tried all means possible to entice, catch, and even kill a ninja from their world but we have been repeatedly unsuccessful for the last year. We aren't even sure if John has other powers except for dreaming. If he has other allies who he hasn't revealed yet do you think we would be able to survive? Every single character that he has revealed possess extraordinary means. Let the insight project come to fruition only then we could be relieved. Even if we kill millions the world of Naruto wouldn't have any choice but to cooperate with us as they need us too for sustenance. About these gods, don't they come from another planet? They will leave when this farce is over anyways. 71 The Destroyer In addition John is a consultant of S.H.I.E.L.D., do you think Fury will leave if there is an assassination attempt on him? Hydra isn't ready to raise its head. We are already trying to contact with the country lords of Naruto. Maybe we can extract some of Ninja's powers. So don't take any rash decision without authorization. Pierce continued. Actually Pierce had too much confidence on Insight Project. No matter how powerful those heli carriers were, they would be destroyed by just John alone if he wanted. For this reason John never cared about Hydra. Hydra was hidden too deep on all walks of life poisoning the system, so even if John wanted to he would have to face a lot of opposition while cleaning Hydra. He wanted to catch all the heads of Hydra including Malik, Daniel Whitehall, and other heads spread all over the world in a single assault. Sitwell listened to the reprimand of Pierce and couldn't refute him. But Sitwell had a feeling that in the establishment of Order of Hydra, John might be the greatest hindrance. The next few days went as peaceful as it could be in Puente Antiguo. John joined Thor and others and talked about different things. It was Thor mostly talking about the different realms that are under Asgard. Diana felt sad hearing the stories of Thor as the Paradise Island never had such background. If they had, they wouldn't have to be hidden for such a long time. Suddenly one fine morning the friends of Thor appeared in the doorstep of the place where Thor was living his days. John too was present at that time. Sif and others told Thor the truth about Loki and his planes. As Thor was discussing with his friends John called Kaolson. Kaolson, evacuate the town, there is a fight incoming. This fight will rage the town to the ground. Fight? Is there a fight coming? How do you know about it? Who is the enemy? Kaolson sounded worried. There is no time Kaolson, if you trust me just do it. The guns and weapons which you have won't be even able to scratch the enemy. Just do it fast if you don't want to see casualties. John replied. As he said that he saw there were clouds forming in whirlpool shape. John knew that the destroyer was coming. Kaolson also saw this phenomenon and chose to believe John at the end. He ordered the agents to evacuate the town as John suggested and went to the town itself to assessing the threat. Diana you know what you have to do John said to Diana who was sitting beside. Yes, let me go change myself. Diana said as she walked away. Thor you need to evacuate the people, you are immortal now. John said as they saw the destroyer, which was sent by Loki, approaching. Diana who returned with her armor also helped the people. The residents didn't believe them at first but when the agents arrived and said it was from FBI, the existence of S.H.I.E.L.D. is still a secret, and their town might be under threat, only then did they leave. When the agents saw a huge iron giant walking while destroying everything in its path did the agents take the order more seriously. Some even shot at the destroyer but it couldn't even scratch its armor. We need a distraction for me to shove my spear into the destroyer. Maybe that will stop it. Sif suggested. Valstag and others agreed to her suggestion. Thor on the other hand looked at Diana and said. Can you help us? Yes I will help you in this fight but you need to get your powers back, otherwise you will die if you join the fight. This destruction and hatred was caused by me, I want to be in the end of it. Thor replied. Valstag and other two of his friends approached the destroyer from front, while Sif took a different route to sneak towards the destroyer. Fondrel and Hagan threw Valstag towards the destroyer and the destroyer anticipating it slapped at Valstag with his hand. That slap was powerful enough to throw him the same direction as he came from. As the destroyer opened its face to shoot at Valstag with its heat beam, Sif who was on the roof of a building beside the destroyer jumped onto it and shoved her spear through the neck of the destroyer. It stopped the destroyer and Sif felt relieved seeing it. The destroyer which got shut down due to the spear after few moments rotated itself and opened its face again to shoot at Sif. Sif who thought was going to be blasted away suddenly felt herself being drawn away from the shooting range. She saw she was being tied by a shining rope. As she turned her head she saw her savior. It was the woman who was sitting beside Thor before when they went to meet him. Let me join this fun. Diana said to her. 72 Thor being worthy again. Diana swung her lasso towards the foot of the destroyer. As it caught and bounded its foot, Diana pulled it strongly. It prompted the destroyer to lose its balance and fall. The next moment Diana jumped towards the destroyer with her sword and round shield. She stuck the body of the destroyer with her sword creating sparks on its wherever the sword hit. Soon there was damage being seen on the abdomen and on the hands of the destroyer. Loki who was in Asgard was surprised by this. He couldn't believe that in a mortal world there was a person who had so much power. Sif and her friends too were little taken aback by her power. As she was going to land another hit on the face of the destroyer, it flicked its hand towards Diana. 
Diana tried blocking with her hand but the huge momentum threw her away two blocks away damaging the houses on which she went through. St. How powerful is this iron giant? Said an agent who was watching this fight scene. The destroyer got up and started healing its damage that was caused by Diana. It started walking towards the place where Diana was thrown away. Diana who finally stood up saw the destroyer approaching. The destroyer opened its face and shoot a beam at her. Diana saw that and immediately put up her shield. It stopped the beam from causing any bodily damage to her but she was again thrown many feet behind destroying the properties in its wake. As the beam stopped, Diana put down the shield. Loki who was watching it had a solemn look on his face. Diana took her hands far apart from each other and banged her bracelets. Boom. This caused a huge shockwave damaging all the properties surrounding her. When it hit the destroyer, it was flown several meters. When it landed it destroyed the gas station causing a huge explosion. Everybody cheered when they saw it. But Diana still had a solemn look on her face as she felt it wasn't enough to stop the destroyer. Sure enough after the fires receded a bit, people saw the destroyer coming out of the fire. Odin really outdid himself when he made the destroyer, didn't he? Sif said while looking at the destroyer who was healing its damage. Everybody felt desperate as even such a powerful blow of Diana couldn't do any damage to the destroyer. Thor who was watching this finally couldn't stand still. He started walking towards the destroyer. Diana who saw this didn't stop Thor as she knew this was a rivalry between two brothers. Thor stopped near the destroyer and said. Brother whatever I have done to wrong you, whatever I have done to lead you to do this, I am truly sorry. Hurting these people will get you nothing, take me instead. The destroyer opened its face again to shoot a beam, but stopped finally. It turned around as if to walk away but it did that the destroyer hit with its back hand Thor heavily. Thor was thrown away by this huge impact. Jane rushed towards Thor and held him in his arms. It's over. Everybody is safe. Thor said as if it was his last breath. No no, it's not over. Jane said in panic as she felt Thor might die soon. Thor finally became unconscious after seeing the destroyer didn't continue the assault. Mjolnir which was miles away suddenly started shaking. The shaking intensified as it lifted up by itself. The next moment it flew fast towards Thor. Diana who saw it from afar ran towards Jane and lifted her up to keep her away from the force of the coming Jalnir. The hammer flew to the hand of Thor who was woken up by it. Soon an armor was woven on his body. Lightning flashed and came out Thor who looked the same as he did before he was exiled. All the wounds had healed. The destroyer who saw this was ready to shoot a beam at Thor but was instantly knocked out by the flying Jalnir. Want to finish what you started? Thor said to Diana. Gladly. Diana replied. You attack from ground, I will bring him up in the air. And then we blow him up. Sure Diana replied. Thor flew high up in the air and started rotating the hammer. It created a whirlpool almost instantly. The whirlpool covered the destroyer. As the whirlpool started rotating fast everything nearby got sucked into it. The destroyer tried shooting beams at Thor but it was blocked off by Mjolnir. The winds created by the whirlpool was fast enough to lift the destroyer up. As it floated up Diana came to the eye of whirlpool to get ready for the final attack. Thor too lined himself up to hit the destroyer and threw his hammer towards the destroyer and Diana banged her bangles. This caused a huge surge again and stuck the body of the destroyer at almost the same moment as the surge created by Diana. The destroyer was immediately knocked down. 73 returned back. The destroyer didn't get up after this. All finally felt relieved. John who was watching this was also relieved. Because he didn't want to bring out more characters to deal with it. John knew that Diana showing up might itself be a variable in Loki's preparation for the New York War but he was ready to take the risk. John didn't want too much butterfly effect till the New York War. After that he might change the route of the story. Thor came down and thanked Diana. He needed to go back to Asgard to deal with Loki before he did something stupid. Thor called Heimdall but there was no response. But after few moments the Bifrost finally opened. The Bifrost even took away the knocked down body of the destroyer. Thor and his friends went into the Bifrost and vanished. Thor even invited Diana to go with him to Asgard as she herself was of God's blood. Thor wanted to know more about her and the place she came from. But Diana refused as she wanted to be here. She had more things to do on Earth. After speaking with Kowlson, John was ready to leave with Diana to New York. He needed to introduce her to Bruce and give her a place to stay. John already had a place in his mind for her to live. How did you know that the destroyer will come and invade the town? Cowlson asked. My dreams can sometimes look into future. Didn't I mention this on our first conversation? John replied. Cowlson had a solemn look on his face after this but didn't say anything. We need to assess Diana's identity. Cowlson added at the end. I remember Fury wanted to check out the Jurassic Park for risk assessment. Tell him to go over there. Diana will be staying there as a curator of the park. John said. Cowlson nodded to that. The plot of Thor proceeded exactly like it was supposed to with Loki falling into the abyss and destruction of the Rainbow Bridge. Even though John didn't participate in it he had hoped that the plot won't change as Loki was required to deal with Kong. The next day John and Diana reached New York. After reaching they went straight to Bruce's place. When Diana entered Bruce's apartment, she saw Alfred and immediately felt happy. It's nice to see you again Alfred. Miss Diana? Welcome to this world. How have you been? Alfred said with a genuine smile. I am fine. Where is Bruce? Diana asked. He is in his lab. Diana went to the underground lab John provided Bruce with a huge lab and necessary equipment. 
Now Bruce doesn't stay with Tony much as Tony now had a girlfriend and he didn't want to be in an awkward position. Tony too understood so didn't say anything. Now they both carry out their research in their respective labs while cooperating when required. As Diana went to the new Batcave, Bruce too received the notification. He was happy to see an old comrade again. They talked about lot of things about the past and Bruce even said about the extra memory which he had of Darkseid. Diana was also shocked when she heard all this. It's fine now. Darkseid isn't in this world. You don't need to worry about him. John said as he listened to their conversation and added. Diana we need to go to the place where you will live. Fury will come soon so we can go with him together. As the three were talking John received a text. I have a surprise for you. Surprise? What surprise? John replied via text. Guess where I am, came the question. New York. John texted as his eyes went big with expectation. Yes. I am about to check out. Want to pick me up? Emma messaged him. We'll be there in a few minutes John texted and hurriedly left. John sat on the car and said B take me to the airport as fast as possible. B drove to the airport quite fast without breaking the speed limit. As John went out of his car he saw Emma standing while hiding her face wearing a mask as she didn't want to be recognized by people. John came near her and said. That was quite a surprise. The shooting ended day before yesterday. So after packing myself I took the flight. You promised me you will take me to Jurassic Park when I come to New York. So now I am here. You came to New York so that you can visit Jurassic Park and not me? I am hurt John said with mock sadness. Ha. Huh. Twisting my words. Of course I missed you. Emma said as she kissed him. John responded to her kiss. Let's go before people recognize us. John said and took her hand and led to the car. Let's go back to my home. I will introduce you to my father and VAL. UMM are you sure about it? Emma said with hesitation. Why? Aren't you my girlfriend already? John asked her with seriousness. He felt for a second that he might have crossed the line in this regard but her next words relieved her. Of course I am your girlfriend but is it okay to meet you father? He kind of scares me. Sorry. Cringe. 74 Emma is in New York. Ha 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 you don't have to worry about it. Dad always listens to me. John said being relieved. It's been almost two years they had been dating and John wanted to introduce her to his family. John and Emma reached his home and went inside. Val was present as usual taking care of the house. John introduced her to VAL Valentina was very happy that John had brought a girl. She used to think John probably would die single after watching his lifestyle but finally saw hope. John took her to the guest room and allowed her to fresh herself after a long flight. After an hour or so Emma came out looking fresh and wet hair. John who was sitting in the family saw her in that look and almost melted in his seat. Emma sat beside him and he couldn't stop himself from kissing her. Jameson still had couple of hours left to return so they started talking. Emma was excited about the Jurassic Park and she couldn't stop herself but John remembered that Fury would join him in this expedition. Emma what do you think of me? Like from a third person's perspective. John suddenly asked. Huh? I don't understand. What do you mean? She replied being confused. For example, if you have never known me, what would you think of me? Um, probably a mysterious business tycoon who never shows his face. In my crew everybody wants to know more about you. You are a legend. Emma laughed. Mysterious? Maybe I am. Emma my world is very different. My world is dangerous. More dangerous than you can imagine he said. Emma was confused by this so she asked. Dangerous? You mean your relation with Tony Stark and Bruce makes you vulnerable? Emma asked. Emma knew how politics worked, even though John had huge influence sometimes politics could be overwhelming. John not being a part of politics had already surprised her so she thought John was threatened by something. No Emma it's not them, people don't actually matter to me. I am trying to say about other things. Did you watch Wonder Woman? John said. Yes. It's a good superhero movie. What if I tell you Diana Prince is real? John asked with a serious face. Huh? Good joke John, you almost fooled me with your serious face. Emma said with a laugh but after a couple of seconds she saw that John had no change of face. You gotta be kidding me? Say that it's a joke. Emma asked now with all seriousness. I wish it was a joke Emma but it isn't. Diana does exist and tomorrow you will get to see her. John said. I don't understand. Her existing means gods once lived in Earth? If it's true why would you make a movie on her? Isn't that exposing you in front of people if her identity gets revealed? Emma asked. John was surprised by her thoughtfulness. Gods exist, yes. But your notion of gods and real gods are different. About me showing her it's because she doesn't belong to our universe. John then proceeded to explain her about his false parallel universe theory and told her it's his way of contacting the people who comes from other universes and his subsequent dreams. Emma was shaken, in fact a part of her still didn't believe him. But John's insistence and promise of introducing her to Diana convinced her somehow. As John was explaining many things to her, Jameson returned. He saw his son talking with a girl in the family room. Even though he heard rumors of his dating in England he never paid heed to it. But when he saw Emma talking with John he knew that the rumors were true. Dad, she is Emma, my girlfriend. Emma this is my father, J. Jonah Jameson. John introduced them to each other. Hello Mr. Jameson it's nice to meet you. Emma said with a hint of blush on her face. Hello Miss Emma. It's nice to meet you too. My son has a girlfriend now. Looks like he has grown up finally. Son I need to talk to you in private. Jameson said with a laugh and a hint of seriousness at the end. 
Private? What happened? You can speak in front of her. She knows about my secret. I just told her. John said. Jameson was surprised that Emma knew his secret. Jameson hesitated for a second and finally said. I heard there was an incident in New Mexico. Were you involved? I saw that you went there few days ago. Yes. There was an incident and it's resolved. Diana has appeared. John said. What? Even she is real? No wonder you showed her connection with Batman in the movie. Next time don't be mysterious and inform me from before who will be appearing. Dad I am never sure who will appear. I just see my dreams and make it in reality. Not all characters I make come to this world. John shrugged and lied straight out. 75 Jurassic Park. So Emma now you believe me? I don't think I would make an elaborate plan with my father to fool you. John said looking at Emma. Emma blushed a little but didn't say anything. Dad I will go to Jurassic Park want to join. John asked hi father. Jurassic Park? Sure. I didn't get to see them with my own eyes. Will be a short vacation for me. We can take Val too with her family. Of course. You all should pack up. Oh yes the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. might join too John added. S.H.I.E.L.D.? Okay Jameson said as he knew John being a consultant of S.H.I.E.L.D. What is S.H.I.E.L.D.? Emma who was listening to the conversation asked. S.H.I.E.L.D. is a secret organization which is responsible for handling any weird situations or people. Like Diana and others. John explained. After talking for an hour or so John and others went to rest. John even introduced her to the cube and helped her transformed her mobile. They both named it Bicorn after a creature from Harry Potter books. Emma was really happy as now she had a pet that could accompany her. The next day everybody got ready. The children of Val were thrilled to see Emma as they too were fans of Harry Potter and started pestering about Harry Potter. In the end Val somehow curbed their enthusiasm. As they reached the private hangar they saw two black SUVs waiting for them in the hangar. Fury was standing in front of some agents and a woman standing right beside him. Morning Fury, you must be Maria Hill. Nice to meet you. John said surprising both Hill and Fury. You really do know a lot of S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury murmured. Hill was taken aback but she was briefed about John before coming with Fury so she smiled politely and said. Hello Mr. John, first time meeting I presume. And this must be the famous Miss Emma Watson. You have already heard my name and he is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hill said trying to gain the same momentum as John. Seems like you have done your homework. My private life is a joke. John lamented. Please Mr. John you are a consultant of S.H.I.E.L.D., if anything happens to you not only S.H.I.E.L.D. but the world will delve into chaos. Fury said this time justifying his invasion on the privacy of John. John shrugged but didn't say anything. John knew he should let him being monitored as he didn't want to raise eyebrows of Hydra yet. At least not before the shielding technology is made. He gritted his teeth and accepted it. The next moment two luxury cars came roaring by and stopped in front of them. From the first car Tony, Pepper, and Happy stepped out and from the next car Bruce, Diana and Alfred came out. You are late Tony. John said. I am Stark. Do you think I care? Oh who is this woman? Your girlfriend. Never expected you to have a girlfriend Tony said as he saw John holding a woman's hand. A eh, Bruce? You have a girlfriend too. Tony said after noticing a woman with Bruce. She is Diana, princess of Amazon. Bruce said before Tony could say something inappropriate. Tony shuddered after hearing this. Emma too who was listening trembled a bit. For normal people the notion of gods were still a huge moat to cross. You are really a demigod. Tony said after coming back to normal in couple of seconds and seemed unfazed again. Gods are just an exaggeration. I am not invincible. Diana shook her head and said. Hello Miss Diana, I am Nick Fury, Director Shield. John might have already introduced us. I hope we can have a healthy cooperation in the future. Fury said while approaching Diana. They both shook hands. I heard Bruce is a consultant of S.H.I.E.L.D., I can occupy the same position but I don't like to be disturbed. Diana said, that's for sure. After a normal assessment you are free to do whatever you want. Fury said, Fury I will appoint her as the curator of Jurassic Park. She is knowledgeable enough to handle the park Tony is that fine. John said, sure. A demigod responsible for the park will be perfect. Even though the dinosaurs can never cause any problems for us but she being on the top is an added security. Saying that they all boarded into the private plane. Emma was looking at Diana and others all the way as she was the only normal person here. She had never even seen Tony up close, forget about a demigod. She was little overwhelmed. What happened? Are you okay? John asked as he felt she was little off. Your world is completely different. I thought money is all there it is for you, but money is just a small aspect of yours. I am just a normal girl. Do I fit here? Emma said with melancholy. Emma we have all started somewhere. Tony too was just a rich arms dealer. Don't worry being with me you two will get used to this world. You can't imagine what a normal person is capable of if that person is determined enough. John said as they sat on their seat in the plane. 